Uh, so hi everyone, my name is uh, Eddie Bersten and I'm going to present you today with uh, Jean-Michel and Mathieu, which is here at OWAD, uh, which is a cloud-based forensic tool. Uh, Yvonne couldn't join us today. So the premise of this talk is the world is moving to the cloud. I see a lot of people here in this room using their laptop or iPad and all of you have some sort of data in the cloud. Uh, for instance, uh, we know that 2.7 million photos uh, are uploaded to Facebook every 20 minutes, and about 100 million new files are saved on Dropbox every day. So a lot of data is flowing from uh, computer to the cloud, and people move almost everything which has value for forensic to the cloud, including emails, which are moving to uh, webmail, uh, contacts, which are moving to uh, social networks, like LinkedIn, and of course, photo, which are uploaded to a photo website uh, such as Facebook or Flickr and so forth. And it has a huge impact on everyone who do forensics today, as there is more data, but this data also became harder to reach because you can't just take down the, the files and recover them. They are not in the hard drive by itself. So what we need is we need to have a change in how we deal forensic, and we need to move to uh, what I, could, I would say, reinvent the field and do cloud forensic. But what is cloud forensic exactly? What we mean by cloud forensic is the ability from the hard drive to recover the necessary information to get the online data and use them in our forensic case. Once again, I'm not going to discuss whether it's legal or not. I'm just telling you what is possible from a technical point of view, and I'll let you guys figure out uh, with the lawyer whether you can do it or not. Uh, let me give you an example why it's hard. Uh, let's assume I want to know who is someone on Facebook. I get a hard drive and I know this pe person is the user of Facebook. Now I need to know who he is. To get the Facebook credentials, they are probably stored in IE uh, Password Manager. So IE Password Manager is encrypted with DP API. So if I want to decrypt that, I have to uh, decrypt the DPAPI master key. To decrypt the DPI master key, I have to actually decrypt the uh, Windows password. And to decrypt the Windows password, I have to be able to decrypt the SAM. If we sum up all of this, we actually need to bypass four layers of encryptions to get to the point where I get my Facebook credential from my hard drive. And this is my promise to you, this is what the talk is about is about how we bypass layer of encryption which are stuck on a Windows disk to get the data you want, which are a user history uh, and credential for the web. And I'm going to walk you through every step we need to do that. And we also have written a tool, which is open source, and you will be able to get after the demo, after the talk, we're going to make it public, which is called OWADE, which stands for uh, offline Windows analysis and data extraction tool. It's an open source tool which is written in Python and work on Linux. Uh, this tool is able to decrypt uh, DP API secret, which are the uh, data encrypted with the Windows API using OpenSSL only. It's fully open source. And we are also able to recover browser history and credential for all the major four. And we also are able to recover uh, instant messaging credentials such as Skype one. And finally, we're also able to recover Wi-Fi data, such as the access, uh, the uh, WPA key from the, the hard drive. So, a world look like this. Uh, it's basically a the, the interface is a web interface, and you can click on it. And I'm going to show you various screenshots. And maybe as then we will be able to do a demo, but we have to switch laptops, so maybe it will work, maybe not. Uh, in any case, you can download it. So, how a world works? What is the big picture for that? Uh, a what works by first you take a disk and then we're going to do an image of this disk as we're not always to uh, tamper with evidence. And when we have this disk image, we're going to extract the registry from this disk and also the files. When we have that, we're going to go deeper into uh, the, the hierarchy and do more advanced analysis. The first one being we need to recover Windows credential. When we have the Windows credential, we are able to actually extract also the Wi-Fi data, such as the WPA key, and we also extract a bunch of hardware information as some software like Google Talk actually use some of the hardware information to uh, encrypt the data. When we have that, we move to another 
an upper layer, which is the uh, application layer, where we're going to recover Internet Explorer, Chrome, uh, Firefox, Safari, Insert Messaging, and uh, Skype credential. And we're going to work you through all the process to do that. And when you have that, we also have some probes to go to online services and extract the data with the credential we have. That's what OWAD is doing. So let's see how, we're going to play, uh, how this talk is going to be, uh, the rest of the talk is. So first, we're going to give you a, fee, a quick, very quick uh, file forensic refresher to see how we get from the disk to the registry. Then I'm going to tell you about the Windows crypto system for those who are not familiar with it, how it works, uh, how DP API works, so you get the idea how we can decrypt that. Then we're going to do how you can actually extract Wi-Fi data and how you used to be able to uh, do geolocalization with that until Microsoft patch, patched it, I think, Sunday morning. So, and then uh, how you recover browser data, like, such as history and uh, credentials, such as login and password. Then I'm going to discuss with you what are the algorithms which I use uh, in insert messaging software. And finally, we're going to discuss a little bit how you can acquire directly uh, cloud service data. And finally, if it works, as I said, we're going to show you a real live demo of OWAD. And if it doesn't work, then you can download yourself the code and test it. Uh, Fail-based forensic. So there, there is different kind of hard drive you can get. The standard one is you, say, you see the laptop, and all you have to do is plug the disk, and then you recover all the files. And there is some file in the trash, but there is an utility for that, which is undelete, and we recover them. Uh, if the files are deleted, we have to do file carving, which basically look sector by sector on your hard drive and try to look for fingerprint of each, uh, each file. This is standard techniques. And if the disk is whipped, uh, my only advice for you is go ask the NSA how they do it. I have no idea. So uh, the Windows registry, they are basically on the, on the disk. They are basically a DAT file which are located into the Windows directory. And they contain a ton of information, such as the hardware information, uh, software install with the version and serial number, and they also have the Windows credential which are encrypted. Uh, if you look at how OWAD do that, it's actually going to display you a, notch, a bunch of information. Uh, for instance, here you can see that the disk from which we extracted uh, the information is actually a core i7, and you have the frequency of the processors, and we also have the ability to know every type of uh, USB token and dongle you have ever plugged to the computer. So if you want to know if someone actually put a USB key on your computer, you can actually know that from the registry. So that's the registry information. Let's move on to the crypto, uh, Windows crypto ecosystem. So the crypto uh, ecosystem by Microsoft is used by a lot of Microsoft products, of course, but also third-party software, such as uh, Google products and Apple products. So you need to be able to deal with Microsoft encryption if you want to acquire high-level data. So. A big, the big picture is the following. At, at the bottom, you have the crypto API, which do all the encryptions by itself. And you have the sec, um, security account manager, which basically store all the user password. Uh, it's like the keychain in Apple. And then you have sort of. And then you have DP API, which is basically a transparent API for a program to encrypt and decrypt data, which is going to be tied to the user password. And on top of that, you have something else on a, second, a third layer, which is the credential manager, uh, which is an API which deals with encryptions and also storage. So when you use a credential manager, Windows encrypts it and stores it for you, and you just ask to retrieve it. It's just like uh, view it as a DB uh, with where you don't know where the DB is, but it's actually going to be encrypted for you. So crypto Windows API uh, do basic cryptography, or every basic block you can Im so imagine uh, from uh, Cypher encryption, FreePRDS, AES, uh, hash functions, SHA1, and so forth, and public key crypto. We're not really concerned in this talk with public key crypto. We're not concerned directly, actually, with this uh, crypto API, because in OWAD, we use OpenSSL, which actually do exactly the same, except it's open source, and it's run on uh, Linux, of course. So how the password are stored? How the Windows password are stored on Windows? Well, uh, they are stored in what is called the uh, SAM, the Security Account Managers, and it's located into the registry, and it's encrypted with a syskey. So the syskey was an attempt from Microsoft to actually prevent you to decrypt the password offline, so they offer the option to put the syskey on a USB key. I never found anyone 
ever who have ever put it on a USB key, but in theory you can. There is, you know, there is the option somewhere. I have no idea how to put this pop-up actually in Windows, but in theory you can. And when you don't do it, well, the key is on the disk. So what OWAD is doing is look through the registry and is going to find the syskey and decrypt the, the stamp for you. And then we have the hash of the password. So that's why I say encrypted because it's unlikely that anyone ever use it. Maybe it's possible, just I never encounter anyone of this. And the password are not stored in clear. They are stored in a hash with the hash functions. And in practice, uh, Windows use two kinds of hash functions. So the first one is called the landman or LM hash function, which has been introduced is in NT and is actually considered as a weak hash function. I'm going to be uh, discussing this, this in the next slide. And uh, starting XP, they have the NTLM, which has become the default function for Windows 7. And NTLM is on, and LM hashes are only disabled by default starting Windows 7, which means that we can actually exploit the weakness in LM hashes up to Vista. So one thing to note is passwords are not sorted, meaning that we don't have a random string in top on front of them, which means that we can use pre-computed attack as well, uh, also known as rainbow table on Windows password. Uh, let me give you an, an overview why LMH are weak. Uh, first, uh, they decided for a very old reason that we're not going to use lowercase. So when you actually use LMH before hashing, uh, Windows put your password in uppercase. So it doesn't matter if you type lowercase or uppercase, it's actually the same. And then for an another odd reason that I can't explain myself, they decided that instead of storing the password in one hash, they split it in two hash. The first hash is the first seven character. The second one is the, second, the seventh part of the character. So now all we have to do is crack a seven uh, character long hash. So it turns out that the complexity of it, so you have an example uh, in blue, uh, if your password is my password, first it's put into uppercase, and then you're going to have two hashes which are going to be concatenated. Uh, so in, at this in this case, uh, the complex, the key space, the full key space of uh, LM hashes are uh, 69 to the power of seven, which is something we can actually pre-compute uh, completely ahead of time. And this is rainbow table. So rainbow table are basically a trade-off between memory and time. So you pre-compute all the passwords, but instead of storing them directly on the disk, uh, you store them with a little bit of computation. It's called chain. Uh, the basic idea is uh, it's slow, it increases the speed of recovery of the password, but you still have to do some little computations, and it doesn't take a lot of space. Uh, the LM hashes in the rainbow table is about 64 gigabytes of data, which is absolutely nothing in today. Uh, I mean, with the price of a hard drive today, not an issue to store that. Um, and rainbow table for all the LM hashes, all of them, which means instant recovery or almost quite almost instant recovery are available for download from multiple websites. So LM hashes are not, if you are using XP, uh, our success rate to recover your password is close to 100%. That's how it is. Uh, so how OWAD works? Uh, OWAD, OWAD first extracts the username as a password hash and then it's going to test if we have the LMH. If the LMH is there, then we're fine. We're going to try to use John the Ripper, and we plan to have a rainbow table module to just crack it and have the password in uppercase. And then we're going to use the NTLM hash, which is case sensitive to actually figure out what is the uh, uh, case of our, your password, and then we're good to go. If we only have NTLM, well, uh, we're going to try a rainbow table up to seven characters because some of them are available. And we're going to use John the Ripper, which is a password cracker, uh, which is the most well-known, I think, open source uh, password cracker to try to go after that and try dictionary and so forth. And hopefully, we might be able to recover your password. Uh, once this is done, uh, OWAD is going to show you something like this, which is uh, the, the name of the user, the hash, the two hash you can have, and then the password if we can get it. Uh, when you see unknown, is basically when we are not successful at recovering it. And if you are following me so far, what I said is if you have seven, which is not currently supported in the release of OWAD, but it, if you are on Windows 7, well, sometimes we can't crack uh, the password if the password is strong. And well, sometimes if the password is too strong, well, I must say we can't recover it. Uh, but in a way, it's not that a big deal because there is other way we don't really need the password to extract your application data. 
And that's why that's how DPIPI works and how it stores its key, which makes this possible. I'm going to give you, uh, I'm going to explain this after I explain how DPIPI works. So, the DPIPI, also known as Data Protection API, is uh, the API released by Microsoft with the idea in mind that if you store high level passwords, they should be tied to your Windows uh, password. So, the same user on the same computer or people who are able to, rec to steal your laptop are not able to extract uh, your password directly without doing some work. Um, it's a black box API. So basically, the, the Microsoft documentation is very succinct. It's going to say, here's a function to encrypt, and you get a blob. Here's a function to decrypt. You give me a blob, I give you the key. Uh, the main point is uh, DPAPI sole goal is to tie your, your encryption data with the user password. Um, how it works in practice is it's a derivation scheme. Uh, what we need is actually is the SHA1 of the password. We don't need the password itself. We need the SHA1 of the password, uh, which is going to be used to compute a pre-key. And these pre-keys are going to be used uh, to decrypt the master key, which it's a big chunk of 512 bits of entropy that you use to decrypt the blob key, which is going to contain your data. And then from there, we, have to, we get the content of the blob which is usually the credential you are looking for. Uh, and of course, it's applied to multiple blob keys. Uh, briefly, the structure of a data blob uh, look like this. Uh, you have the cipher you are going to use. It is triple DES on XP. It is AS on uh, 7. You have also in orange, as you can see, you have the obviously your data encrypted, and you also have the salt. Uh, the data is salted, so if you have two blobs which are the same, we won't be able to tell because we have a salt. And you, that's how a blob is. And you have a ton of information on this. If you want to, to really understand how DPAPI works, we actually made a presentation about that about a year ago. So we, you have all the nifty details there. But the basic idea is you have this structure. And the master key uh, contains, as well, a salt, a MAC algorithm to, for integrity purposes, and a cipher text. A cipher uh, an encrypted block, which is uh, encrypted with a cipher algorithm. Uh, again, triple DS for uh, XP and 7, seven and AES for uh, Windows 7. So, how does it work in practice? Let's see how we can actually decrypt a DPAPI blob step by step. So, we recover the DPAPI blob. From there, uh, we're going to look for the master GYD because there is multiple master key. You have one which is generated every three months by Windows, so we need to know which one we need to use. And then uh, from this master key, as I said, we're going to be able to uh, compute the pre-key by using the SHA1 of the user password. And from there, we are able to decrypt the master key. When we have the master key, uh, to get the master key, we need to know which cipher we need uh, to use and the salt which we extract from the master key file. Then uh, we're going to try to decrypt the blob key. To decrypt the blob key, you need the salt and the initialization vector, which is in the DPAPI blob. But, and there is a big but here, for at least for forensic, is software can add an extra entropy here. And this entropy is required to decrypt the blob. And that's really what makes reverse of all the application hard, is every software we know, or at least every software which has reasonable security, have a different and unique way to compute this uh, extra entropy. And so every time you want to add a new uh, decryption algorithm, let's say for Firefox or for, Sa no, not Firefox, uh, for Safari, Chrome, or uh, let's say, then you have to actually look into their uh, derivation scheme and you have to figure out how they derive uh, this, extra, this, this extra entropy. So back to the, what I said before, what happens if we can't crack the Windows password? Well. As I said, we don't really need the, the password. All we need is the SHA1 of the password. It turns out that if you have a laptop, it's stored into the Ibernet file. When you put your computer on sleep, the password is actually stored in the Ibernet file. And thanks to Matthew's switch uh, tool, Moonsol, you can actually uh, look into the Ibernet file and extract from it the SHA1. We have an heuristic for that. And then we just use that. So we don't have your password, but we can still decrypt your uh, Internet Explorer or your uh, Safari content. Uh, main point, as I said, uh, is the software additional to view it as a key. That's a key which actually prevents us to decrypt all the password in a generic fashion. We need to figure out how this key works. 
and it usually requires a lot of time. Uh, some people do the smart thing, which is they try to tie the software encryption to the machine by looking at some hardware data, like uh, the volume key, uh, to get all the net birth name. So that's why we have to do all the registry analysis beforehand so we can know which information to supply to these derivations schemes that I'm going to present in, the, in a few slides. On top of DP API, we have the uh, credential manager, which actually do encryptions with DP API and then store it into a file which is called the CRED store. Uh, it's used by Windows, Live Messenger, uh, Remote Desktop, and it also contains all your network passwords. Uh, there is three kinds of uh, type of credential which are stored into the CRED store. The first one being generic password, uh, which are encrypted with DP API inside the DP API. So you have to do two rounds of DP API to decrypt them, and you use a fixed string as an additional entropy. So we know what it is. Uh, you ju we just have to figure out where, where it was, and you, you use that. It's used by Live Messenger, which is the IM uh, client from Microsoft. Uh, the domain password are just stored plainly into the CRED store, and it's used, for instance, for NetBIOS password. Uh, domain certificates is only used for Active Directory, uh, such a, and they basically only store the hash of the certificate. And the other one, which is very interesting for us, is the domain visible password. Uh, which use DP API plus another fixed string that you have to pull out from the registry. And it's used for remote access password and also for the .NET Passport, which was used by Microsoft. Uh, how we deal with Wi-Fi data? So information, the information that Windows store for every access point you ever access are the MAC address of it, the BSS ID. Uh, it's key, which is encrypted with DP API, so you can't read it directly, and the last time you access it. Uh, in Windows, XP stored all of this is stored in the registry. In 7, it stored part of it in XML file and part of it into a registry. And one thing which you might notice is if you have two person on the same laptop, both of them have access to the full list of all the access points you ever connected to. So it's encrypted with DP API, but in the same time, it's accessible by every user. So now you can ask yourself, well, how you do that? Well. It's not encrypted with your key, it's encrypted with the system key. But the, ac the system account has no password. And as I said, we need the SHA1 of the password to actually decrypt the DP API. So now you're like, uh, what is my DP API key exactly? And you, you scratch your head, and it turns out that it's a LSA secret. So LSA is, again, another uh, container which is encrypted with syskey. If you remember, the syskey is a thing which encrypts the SAM which should be on a USB key, if someone actually ever does that. And it's basically a array of credentials. And inside this, you have, uh, for instance, the help assistant pass, pa uh, account password. It's here, if you want to actually recover it. And you have also the DP API system, which is actually our uh, key that we are looking for to decrypt uh, Wi-Fi key. So we use, that as a ha we, we, we use that as a DP API key. We decrypt the master key. We decrypt the data, and then we have our Wi-Fi. And we, s we thought we can, be, we can actually extract more information from that. Right? We are uh, advocating for cloud services, and one thing we know is a lot of people have laptops, so we say, well, that would be super cool now that we have the key, and we have the access point to know where they are. Should be great. And it turns out that there is an app for that. Uh, actually, you have it uh, in Firefox. Mozilla have a nice page about that. It's called the uh, Geolocation API, which is used by modern browser to uh, know where you are. So they can actually tell you uh, localized information. And when you ask, they ask for your location, and then you can say, yes, share my locations. That's how it works from the user point of view. Now, how does it work in the back end? Well, behind the curtain, you have this nice little car, you know, this. Uh, Google, Microsoft Car, which are going to do wild driving all across the, the country and all over the world, and they record MAC address and sell tower position and they map it with GPS coordinate. And last year it works perfectly well, and Sami did a talk on that. I did a talk where I show how you can actually extract uh, WPA key from router using success injections and then know where the, the router was. And we say, well, we can integrate this to OWAD. And well, things are never going to be easy, right? So. Uh, in um, June, uh, Google said, OK, let's restrict that. So there was a lot of discussion in, on CNET uh, by uh, Declan, which actually pointed out that this might be bad. And so they say, OK, uh, now you need two MAC address. 
well, I have a bunch of macOS so I can try, but not reliable. So I say, OK, let's start to see how the other browser are doing. How, uh, let's say, Internet Explorer is doing it. It's supposed to be HTML5 compliant. How they are doing it? Well, Microsoft used uh, a live service API, which has been documented in the Windows Mobile MSDN. Uh, it's a long, long, long documentation. But if you just sniff the, the traffic, you're going to see that it's actually a SOAP request which is basically a big XML file that you can post uh, to Live. And Live is going to return you uh, the position of the MAC address. And you only needed one MAC address. So we were, we were fine, and we were happy. And we say, OK, now we can actually uh, do it again with OWAD. And I patch, and I was happy. And one thing I did notice is they have like four identifiers in this kind of request. One is the uh, application ID. I have no idea what it is. Uh, there is a tracking ID. And there is also like the uh, client GUID. And you can actually mess up with all of them. It actually keep responding to you. I have no idea what they use that for, but it's all over the place here. And so we release that as a blog post. Because I contacted Microsoft and say, it's fine. OK, so I say, OK, let me write a blog post about that. I think it's a pretty cool idea. And then over the night, uh, because it has been posted on CNET, and there was a nice article about that, uh, I had 13,000 people actually go to my page and try the demo online. And I have like now an insane list of uh, MAC address that people try on the page. Uh, we get like 50,000 web page uh, overnight people trying it. And somehow micro Microsoft realized that something is wrong. And then they send me an email and say, how about we do a phone call tomorrow? And the tomorrow was Saturday in the middle of the afternoon. So Microsoft do work in Saturday afternoon. They even work on Sunday. That's amazing. And so uh, they, re they issue a statement um, last weekend, and they actually roll out a patch. And um, well, it doesn't work anymore, so there is a patch for that, I guess. Um, this is Microsoft statement. Uh, so now we stand here. Uh, Google use at least require you to have at least two MAC addresses which are close to each other, and Skyhook use. I require at least to have uh, the MAC address you are querying is actually close to your IP, as far as I can tell. And uh, Microsoft require multiple MAC address. I haven't had time to test more deeply. But it seems that all the API does not allow you anymore to geolocalize where your access point was. That being said, if you connect to multiple access points in the same area, you can actually supply both MAC at once, and you might get some hit with that. Um, if you want to see how OWAD displays that, it looks like this. Uh, for each access point, we return you uh, the MAC, the decrypted WPA key, the BSSID, when you did access the, MAC at the access point. So from a corporate point of view, with the tool, you can know if your laptop have ever left uh, the building because you know your own MAC address. So you can actually, by knowing where the, if the user say, my, my laptop went to the corporate network to my home and only there, you have a way to check that. So it's actually a useful tool. Uh, at, in the current state for uh, corporate forensic. Let's discuss a little bit about browser. Uh, so Firefox first, because that's m my favorite browser. So uh, it's all password in the sign-on SQLite. And it's used encryption using triple DS and a master password, which is optional. Uh, the reason why they use this uh, their crypto is because they actually retake Netscape code, which is the NS library, and they never change it. Um, hopefully they will. And they store uh, URL in the place.sqlite, which is SQLite database, and the form field into the, uh, uh, the form field, which is what you feel in the form history.sqlite. So how you decrypt a Firefox password? It's actually not tied to DP API. You need the user path, which is a master password you might have set only for Firefox. And with that, uh, you're going to have to extract a global salt which is located into the keytree.db, which is actually a Berkeley DB version 1.8, which I don't know who else used that, uh, which is from the old days. And with that, you're going to do a derivation scheme, which, invo uh, which involves doing a HMAC using SHA1 to derive the key. And then you have the user key. With the user key, uh, you're going to extract from the keytree.db uh, the user the so user encrypted key, you're going to decrypt uh, another key. Mm -hmm. And the reason why you have this two-prong uh, decryption is because when you, change your, uh, when you change your master password, they don't want to re-encrypt the entire database. So all they do is they re-encrypt uh, this, uh, this key with your, 
with your password manager. And with this, then you can decrypt every, uh, every password and login which are stored into the signon.sqlite database. And then you get your password, and from the signon database, you extract the and you decrypt it. But that's not where the story ends. Uh, how many of you are actually shopping at Amazon? No one is shopping at Amazon? Come on, raise your hand. I do. OK, few people. OK. So when you shop at Amazon, you have to realize that you have inputted a lot of information about you. You do. Uh, for instance, uh, you have inputted, let's say, uh, your name, your address, your phone, and your email. And you have to make this real, because otherwise you will never receive your shiny Kindle. So yeah, there is a feature in the browser which is called the form completions, right? Browser helps you to do form complete, and it's turned on by default. Where is this data on the disk? Where is it? Well, it's in the form field, which are recorded, and it's actually recorded in clear, at least for Firefox. And from there, you can get people addresses, you can get uh, people uh, phone number, and so forth. So actually, by doing higher level, you actually get a lot of intel about who, I who is the, people, uh, the person you, the disk belongs to. You can even know where they live. If they ever shop online, there is a huge chance that it's in the form history, as well as all the search ever inputted into the search box from uh, on the right side of Firefox. And let's take another example. I don't know how many of you have a Cisco uh, router. I do have one. Uh, well, you have to configure your WPA key. The WPA key is not a password. It's a plain field. Where is it? Well, it's in the form field again. So by looking at the form field without doing any sort of decryptions, well, you can also recover the WPA key from the router of the person. So actually, form fields contain a lot of private information. And Safari knows that because they're actually encrypted, uh, encrypting it as well. And I'm actually advocating that Firefox do the same. Uh, so form, form history uh, leaks a lot of personal information, and that's a privacy problem for me, at least. Um, shipping address, Wi-Fi key, credit card information, uh, and, and so forth. Amazon doesn't record your credit card information because they say to the browser, do not autocomplete this one. And you can do it as a developer. If you have a website, you can put authenticity field autocomplete equal off, and it won't be stored. So you can do it. There is an attack for that, but I think many websites will going to get it wrong, so it doesn't hurt to have it this encrypted. How IE works. Uh, so IE have a very, very clever way. Uh, I have to say IE is clever. Uh, I have a very clever way to store passwords. They use DP API, and they have a very, very nifty trick, which is they use URL as a sold. So here's how it works. Uh, you have the SHA1 of the URL. So you have to compute the SHA1 of the signing URL on the website. And you use this with, um, from the URL list. So the way to compute, to, cr to try to crack the, sorry, let me restart. The registry only contains the SHA1 of, of the URL. It doesn't contain the URL by itself. It, it contains the SHA1 of the URL, and this is where the DP API uh, blob, which contains the login and password, is stored. So we don't know which, where the DP API password uh, is linked to which URL. So what you have to know is you have to know the URL and use it to actually compute uh, the SHA1 of the URL. And this is the extra entropy used by IE to encrypt your login and password. Which means that if we do, so the, when you get the blob, you actually have to know which URL you want to decrypt. So if the user clean his history and never store anywhere the, the login, the, the URL of, he has used, we have absolutely no way to recover his login and password. It doesn't matter if we have the DP API key, we just don't know how to compute the extra salt. And I think that's a very clever idea to tie the decryption of the, um, of the login and password to the URL and, store, and not store the URL by itself in clear. What we can do is we can try to maximize our recovery process by going through the entire history, uh, form history, and every browser history and try to extract as much as URL as we can and then try all of them to try to see if we can actually decrypt some DP API blobs. But uh, if the URL is not in any history and they did properly under their uh, uh, let's say by surfing in private mode, then we have absolutely no guarantee that we're going to decrypt all of them, which I think is very, very good. 
um, Chrome, very briefly, they only use DP API. So basically, the, uh, the credentials are stored into SQLite database, and this SQLite database is encrypted with DP API. And uh, Safari, same thing, encrypted with DP API. They use the, the uh, Apple uh, format, which is the proprietary list format, which is a binary format. Um, which is their own way to do things, and they use DP API with a fixed string as entropy. The good thing that actually Safari do and no one else do is they actually are encrypting your form field. So the form fields are encrypted with DP API with Safari, which is, I think is the smart thing to do. So to wrap up, uh, and I have a sad uh, fox here, which is crying, is I think I would I never get I would have had to say that one day, but. Yes, Internet Explorer is the safest browser for offline. Yes, it's true. I have to say that there is no other way to do that. And I'm also very sad to say Firefox is the worst for offline security. And it has to be patched. There is a bug pending for that for like two years. And hopefully, they will fix it, I hope. Please, Sid, fix that. He's there in the, in the audience, the guy who does security for Firefox. Please fix that. Please. Uh, I love Firefox. And they should also uh, make sure to not put the login unencrypted into the login form because it's all encrypted in the form field. So it shouldn't be in clear in the other file. That's two things that Firefox needs to patch. A little bit of word about uh, private mode. Uh, you know the thing you use to actually uh, buy a ring to your wife, right? That's, uh, or maybe porn mode, I don't know. Uh, it turns out that most of the bug has been fixed since we published a paper last year. Uh, one is still remaining. Uh, when you connect to the uh, to HTTPS site, uh, Windows has to verify that the certificate is valid by doing a OCSP request, which is basically say to verify, hey, here's my certificate serial number. Is the certificate still valid? This is stored in a different vault than your history. So even when you clear your history, this remains. So we can actually it's a lot of heavy machine, uh, machine works because we have to scrap all the serial number in the world, but you can actually use that to know which HTTPS website the user has been, whether it's on uh, private mode or not. It has no, no impact on that except Firefox, which actually has its own store, so it's not affected by that. It's for IE, mainly. Uh, we also have another p potential idea how to do that. It's basically looking at the Ethernet file and try to extract URL from it. Uh, we don't know how good it will be. Uh, it's an ongoing work. But we think that's a very important part of OWAD is how to deal with private mode. Because it's likely that the most interesting will be done in private mode. Um, OWAD keeps an aggregated view of all the history URL we ever found on the disk uh, with how many times you have visited them if we know it. Um, and that's how it looks like. So again, OWAD is a web interface so you just can have a, uh, you have a page which say history and then you see all the page, the so you will. Let's discuss a little bit instant messaging software. So uh, the most secure first, Skype. Skype use custom encryption. And the difficulty, I would write it as extreme, as, again, we are not 100% sure we can recover the password. Uh, why? The reason is the way Skype do deal with password. Uh, what he does is. Uh, you can extract uh, from DP API a blob. And we know how to decrypt that. That's fairly standard for, for you by now. And the blob is going to, get, to contain an AES key that you're going to uh, compute us by using SHA1 of the, comp the content of the DP API blob. And from that, you can actually get the encrypted uh, credentials, which are in the config file, and then you think you're done. Well, that's where the problem gets started, which is uh, the credential you decrypt is actually the MD5 of the, 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 the string, the user login, backslash n, skyper, backslash n, pa the, the user password. So we know the user, Skype's username. We can get it from the uh, configuration file. But we don't know its password, so now we have to crack the MD5. So if you choose a very strong password for Skype, well, you are out of luck because we don't know how to, to crack it. We have to do a lot of MD5 try, and we have a patch for John for that. So John the Reaper has a patch, and it's, I think it's going to go mainstream in, uh, in a few uh, weeks. So we have a way to actually try to crack it, but it's a very long password, and we are out of luck. So even if we have all, 
all the AV machinery behind it, there is some software which are actually secure again offline. So we do this password cracking, and as I said, there is a junk patch for that. Google Talk used DP API plus a custom salt. Uh, it has been a lot of work to, uh, to figure out how they actually derive the key. Um, it's stored in the registry. So you start with a string, fix a string, and then uh, you have to get the Windows account name from the SAM, and you're going to mix it. Uh, it's basically an XOR. Um, and then when you have that, uh, you have to take the NetBIOS name of the computer. So basically what they try to do is tie as much as they can Google Talk to your machine. And when you have that, you mix it again. And then you take the DPAPI blob, you decrypt it, you get some data from it, and then you remix it again. And then here you go, you get the credential. That's how you get it. So it's possible. It's completely 100% uh, success. But it's a lot of work to actually come up with the algorithm. And, but now we know it. It's, uh, for you, it's one click, one second to recover it. Uh, Microsoft Messenger, uh, so they keep changing again and again uh, to the point where we have some module. We don't even know if they work because we don't even have a, a Windows uh, Messenger version 7.5. If someone has that, we will be happy to get some data to test. Um, it's not very hard, uh, depending on the version. So the first one was version 5. Uh, Microsoft was like just putting them in clear in the registry. Uh, version 6, they say, let's try to use our own API because our own API is good. Let's use a, use a cred store. Version 7, someone say, oh, no, our own API is not good enough. Let's do something completely different, which is encrypting the salt with DP API and then decrypt the salt and we put it back to decrypt a second DP API blob. And finally, uh, with the live, probably someone, the product manager say, no, guys, you should use our own API. So they back to the cred store. Um, so the one with cred store, we know for sure it works. The version 7.5, I have no idea. We have no data to test. I can't even download the software, so we believe it still works, but we have to test. Uh, now we're going to talk about the other one that some people use, like uh, AMSN. So they decided to use AS, uh, DES, which is simply the eighth first character of your login plus the secret key dummy string, dummy key. Then you just do a DS key, and then you, go, you, you get your password. Now that, and that's obvi obviously very easy, but it's not the worst. Nine talk, which is a French uh, thing, which is basically from SFR now, and we used to be from Nine, which is, was a big provider in France. Uh, they do a better encryption than this. They just use XR9. So if you have kids, you can actually uh, show them the password and ask them to do it by hand. It's a nice uh, cryptographic exercise for people. Uh, completely trivial. Uh, Trillion, which is like uh, based off for which you to have multiple accounts for multiple uh, system, uh, base64 encoded, not encrypted, and then XOR with a very, very long string. Uh, the long string being uh, the same all the time. Uh, very trivial to do. And we have the winner of our day, uh, which is Pigeon, uh, which doesn't know about encryption. Just put your password into clear in the config file. That's so better. That's so much better. I don't know. I mean, I stopped using Pigeon, actually. And then you have this insane guy that I never heard of before, which is PalTalk. So it seems to be popular in some region of the world. Uh, you maybe not heard of it, but these guys have like a pretty cool encryption scheme, which is actually worth discussing because of the encryption scheme. Uh, what they do is they take the volume serial manager number, so from your disk. So you have to get the disk physically, not the image, and look for it. And then they're going to take your account name, and they're going to mix it uh, by doing one character, then one another, then one another, and they're going to repeat this three times. And that's going to be a substitution box. So you take this, then you extract the password from the registry. So it's basically four digits uh, separated by space. The three first digits are used to um, for the password encryption, the the fourth one, I think, is for timestamp. It just doesn't play any role in the encryption, so you remove it. And then you have to do, uh, you take the ASCII code from the, um, from the key you have derived, and you subtract um, the, the YYY. So basically, you take the encrypted characters, and then you have to subtract, subtract the, the part of the S box you just constructed. And actually, you have to do it backward. You start with the last part, and you go that way, and you're going to get your uh, your password. That's how it works. Uh, pretty strange scheme, uh, worth mentioning, because i never seen something like this. 
Um, my takeaway on Messenger is Skype has, if you have a strong password for Skype, it actually can be broken. We have no idea how to break it. We don't believe it's possible. Uh, they have the most robust crypto here. Once again, the trick is do not store the credential on the, on the directly the credential on the, um, on the computer, just store a hash of it. That's the same trick that Microsoft do. I think it's a very nifty trick. Uh, we can actually, if you really want to do it, you can actually have a modified version of Skype that actually is going to inject the decrypted credential so you can log instead of the user, but it only allows you to log in part of the user. You can't actually know what the password was. Um, GTOL can pal talk as the only one to use the computer information to try to tie uh, the encryption to the computer. I think it's a good idea, and I think everyone should do it. And uh, well, uh, if you third party clients are bad, I mean, mainstream clients have to do something to, do to protect your data. Uh, open source projects don't. Doesn't seem to be that focused to have security, which I think is a little bit sad. Uh, and if you look, want to see a what we have a module which actually, when you have run all your analysis, is going to give, have a nice page with all your login and password we extracted from the uh, from the disk, and we're going to tell you which are the most used passwords and how many times you use each password, so you can see if people are reusing passwords uh, and uh, what are the most used uh, email and so forth. So the last part would be, of course, to go to do up to cloud-based forensic. So the basic idea here is we want to leverage the credential we get uh, to extract data from the cloud. Uh, it might be legal. It might be illegal. I have no idea. And I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not going to discuss that with you. Uh, if it's not legal, don't do it, please. Um, and currently, we only have a one probe as a demo. Uh, we have a ton of on the way, like a Facebook one. But for now, we only have one in the release, which is uh, it goes to LinkedIn. A log with the user credential and going to extract his resume in PDF and all his connection photos and name and so forth so you know who the guy is connected with. So that's just a demo, but we can probably do it for every, uh, every services. So how OWAD is currently? What, do you, uh, what are you going to get if you go to the OWAD page and you want to use it? Well, right now you have to check out the code because it's very unstable. It's alpha stage. We know it works on Ubuntu. So if you have an Ubuntu 10.10 .10 or 10.4, you can run it, you can download it. We have an install file, it's going to work. It's only work against XP images. We have to adjust the uh, DPAPI crypto for working on Windows 7. For some reason, it's not like as simple as changing uh, encryption algorithm. There's something different they are doing. We try to figure out how Microsoft change things. Uh, and our current roadmap for the next upcoming weeks are to stabilize the code so it works on based on people reports. Uh, try to modernize the code so everyone can write, write their own module as it's an open source project, it's a GPL trip uh, project. And we have a ton of more cloud prob on the way, uh, extracting emails uh, from every web mail of the world, uh, Facebook uh, cloud probs, and of course, uh, maybe Flickr and Picasa. Uh, and of course, we're working on integrating Windows Vista and uh, 7. As a conclusion, um, People are moving to the cloud. It doesn't mean that there is, uh, it means that there is more data. It also means that we have to work harder when we do forensic to get them. And it's possible. And now that OWAD is public, it should be easy to integrate this with uh, your own set of tools, and, or you can use it like, as is. And we believe that we have overcome uh, this barrier, which was the encryption of Windows and uh, proprietary software uh, encryption, so you can actually get the data. So now it's up to you and to us to figure out how to use this data, uh, what is legal, what is illegal, uh, how we can actually have a nice trick to get more data out of that. Um, and as, as far as we can tell, OWAD is the first tool which is ever able to decrypt uh, browser data from offline and from, from Linux. And it's also the first uh, tool which is able to decrypt instant messaging credential. And of course, it's open source. Uh, the Black Hat asked us today, this year, to actually ask you nicely to fill out your form, please. And uh, thanks for attending this talk. And we're going to try to do a demo, which means I have to switch computer. And hopefully, it's going to work. And then we're going to have a question for you. If you want to download OWAD, it's simply OWAD.org. Uh, it's a Bitbucket repository. And we're going to release the code uh, during the day. Uh, the slide and the slide from this talk and the white paper is already available on the web on my web page. So you can get them and uh, 
feel free to download them if you want. Uh, so we're going to try the demo, and then we can answer questions if you want. And it works. Fantastic. So, okay. So here's OWAD, as you can see. So, as I said, Firefox, my favorite browser. So we're going to we have Firefox, and this is what OWAD looks like. So here is the the main the main page you get uh, when you have finished your analysis. So we have a lot of. Uh, we have a lot of uh, information which are you can um, collapse or expand. Uh, for instance, you get all the details of what is the user environment before when the disk was run. Like for instance, um, the system drive was um, where is the system drive? Where are the profile and so forth? Um, let me show you uh, software details. So the computer had Windows. Explorer version 8, and more precisely, the display versions. Uh, it was running an NVIDIA card because we have the driver 2.7.5.3, which, which were installed. They were installed in the NVIDIA Corporation directory. Um, you also have Skype here, 5.3, uh, where it has been installed. So we can actually, you can actually really know from this where, uh, what kind of software was installed. Um, and you have a long list, of course. I'm going just to contract everything. And um, we also have all the environment for each user. Where are the documents for? Where are all the documents for each user? Where are the favorite and so forth? So we get a lot of information that we use after that to know where to extract the Skype data, or where is the Firefox profile, or where is the IE profile. Then we have, uh, of course, what OS you are using. So it was basically. Uh, Windows XP 5.1 and Service Pack 2, and you have the license info that we can turn back to a serial. I'm not going to show that in the demo. Uh, and you have, as I've said, we have the hardware detail about the computer, like uh, how many, what kind of your USB stick you ever plug into your computer. So if you look at the screen, you can see that actually I plugged a couple of uh, HP uh, USB. Uh, disk on my computer. And actually, Windows is going to store this for every, uh, every key you are plugged to the laptop. So from a per forensic perspective, it's really interesting because you know if someone has violated the uh, copyright policy and has put a USB stick where they should not have. So it's a very useful thing for forensics in case of uh, compromissions. Uh, and you have also what kind of PCI adapter I had and what is my, um, my CPU and so forth. So. We also have program analysis. So, hold on. Hmm? Okay. So, for instance, we're going to take uh, Mathieu account. So, Mathieu has a uh, Firefox password. There you go. The password which has been stored by Firefox. So, the first password was uh, root root for, for OWAD for his own website. Uh, the second one was. Um, from Google, if you want to have a quick access to the password, we have a short page for that. You click on password, and basically, OWAD is just going to display you all the lists in an aggregated view, so you just have a quick look. So from Internet Explorer, we find a password for the domain ash.fr with the login OWAD, and we have it from Firefox, and we have it from Chrome, and you have Gtalk account here, Trillion account, and you can see all of them in one unified um, page. And we can tell you which, which are the most used username and which are the most used address email. So you can do some statistic and analysis and see if people are reusing password or not with a single web page. We also have as a uh, shortcut uh, the uh, history, what the user went to. So it takes a while to load because of a ton of information. 
we see that basically this was mainly used by uh, by, by Matthew to, uh, to work, but you can also see that Matthew is a Steam player here, right? He went to Steam, which is uh, the Valve thing for online, and he also did, uh, he also was reading our, uh, the blog post about our uh, geolocation things on CNET, and um, did a bunch, and even went to match.fr, uh, which is a dating website, and so forth. So you can actually get a lot of information what people are doing with the story. Of course, it's only for demo. Uh, we just be call a bunch of URL just to show you. And um, in the web analysis, um, we also have some file statistics: how many music files we found, how many images files we found, and how many different files we found on the hard drive. And to show you the LinkedIn uh, probe we built, uh, we basically download for you the um, the resume of the person. So we have a OWAD user which is basically, he's a project at Stanford, uh, and he has absolutely no contact because no one wants to fr be friends with him, but you can have his resume here, uh, directly gathered by OWAD. Um, and of course, OWAD deal with multiple cases, so here we only have one hard drive with one partition, but you can have as much as you want, and then you can do, uh, we hope to build some module which is going to do cross-correlation between case, um, and that's pretty much what the demo is about. And now we will be happy to take questions from you guys. And uh, if you have any, want any clarification on any of the module of award, then we'll be happy to answer. Thanks for attending the talk. Yeah. Yes? So the question is, did we ever look at any third-party manager password such as LastPass? The answer is no, we did not yet. Uh, I expect it should be secure, but I don't know. Any other question? OK. So thanks for attending, and uh, I hope you answered the right of the black hat. And if you have any question or if you have any problem with the uh, software, please uh, let us know. Thanks.